You are listening to the Stand Out Now podcast with your host, Dave Mendonca. Check out each episode as top experts share their proven marketing, publicity, and sales tips to help you cut through the advertising noise so you can reach your ideal clients, get noticed, and connect with powerful influencers. The Stand Out Now podcast is brought to you by podcastinterviewexperts.com. Helping entrepreneurs attract clients through business podcast guest appearances. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for listening to the show. Today is a big treat for me because I'm a huge NBA basketball fan, and my guest is a very talented sports author who has written critically acclaimed books such as Michael Jordan, The Life, and Showboat, The Life of Kobe Bryant, Roland Lazenby. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dave. Awesome. Now, Roland, see, the thing I do with guests with the show is I like to go back into their past because uh, I'm always curious about the marketing or sales tips they use. It doesn't matter like what career you're in, what walk of life. I, I want to peel the onion. I want to go back. So just curious about some things in your past. What were some things you really wanted back in the day, say, as a teenager or preteen? And what were the marketing or persuasive methods you used to get it? I really didn't want anything as a teenager except to play football and screw around, you know, not do much work. (laughs) I was a lazy kid, really didn't have thoughts for even going to college. I was working as a plumber's assistant in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia in a little mountain town and had no real thought for anything, really. So that must have really pleased your parents. Uh, well, you know, I'm a parent and a grandparent. I have three kids. And so, yeah, you know, you take your kids through the teen years. You, you always wonder where this thing is headed. And so I'm sure my parents had lots of those thoughts about me. <laughs> For sure. So when did the light turn on? Like, When did a writing become part of the picture and, and you started to get serious about it? I ended up going to college. The only place I applied you know, I graduated in the bottom fourth of my high school class. I had read a lot, so I had good college boards, but I had terrible grades. But it was 1970, and, you know, the Vietnam War was going on, and applications were down at Virginia Military Institute. I could never get in there today, but uh, I was accepted to VMI. And I went there and was fortunate enough to make the football team as a walk-on, but I was a terrible cadet in lots of trouble, both academically and behavior-wise, all kinds of issues. But football was saving me, you know, the chance to just go out. In those days, freshmen weren't eligible. We played a freshman schedule, but we scrimmaged the varsity four days a week. And I guess looking back on it, that was my Super Bowl. But over that process, somewhere in there, I became somewhat interested in writing, mostly just doggerel, nothing special. And I certainly didn't think about writing basketball. My father and his brothers were basketball nuts. And I'd always liked basketball well enough. You know, I played early in school and then I played a lot of pickup. But it wasn't my main thing. And I certainly would never in my early life have thought that I would end up writing so much about anything, much less basketball. What was it? Was it because your family was interested that hooked you in as well? Well, it's kind of a couple of events happened. I I graduated last in my class at VMI, but I became a coach and a high school uh, English teacher. And I was at Blacksburg, Virginia, where Virginia Tech is located. I was teaching at Blacksburg in high school and coaching wrestling there. And uh, in the spring of 77, I had a real bad incident in the middle of the night with sort of a a shattering, blinding, unbelievable headache. And I was rushed to the hospital and I was diagnosed with a brain aneurysm. And I I ended up spending about, I think, about 10 days in the hospital. And the doctor came in and said, well, we think you have a brain aneurysm and it looks like you're about to have your first bleed. And you have about a 30% mortality rate on the first bleed. So I know I was a 24-year-old varsity coach. Hmm. And he said, I know you're only 24, but you need to get your affairs in order because it, it you know, could happen in the next 12 hours. Oh, my God. 
And so that scared me very badly, hmm. as it would anyone. And I sat up all night thinking about things. And it, the first bleed never happened. I was in the hospital another week, and finally the doctor comes in and said, and they'd given me tests, and he said, well, there's one last test we could give you. I had one pupil much larger than the other one. It was sort of a weird thing they'd never seen before. And they said, we could, I could give you one more test, but the problem is, if I give you that test, it could cause a massive stroke. Hmm. And so we don't want to give you the test. And so having raised this issue of my mortality, they discharged me. And so I remember going home and coming in. I, I had, a, I've been married 43 years and I was a young married guy. We had our first child. She wasn't even a year old yet. Mm. And I said, I can't stand this. I got to find out something. So I said, I'm going to go run five miles and I'll find out probably if, you know, what kind of. Because I was a wrestling coach. I was in great shape back then. Mm -hmm. And so I just went and ran five miles and everything was fine. You know, I, I said, you know, I, I remember I used to keep a journal and I remember writing in there. Well, I know what I want to do with my life. I'm not going to waste any of it. I don't want to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And so because I, my wrestling team had won a championship and it had some success in community before that, I had tried to write for some newspapers and no one was interested. But they immediately had me start writing for the local newspaper, just a weekly. And then the editor of the paper quit, and I got offered the job as sports editor for a whopping $2.70 an hour. And I gave up my uh, teaching and coaching job to, because that was what I wanted to do. It was my new life. And I set out to do it. And um I was a sports editor for about three months, won a couple of writing awards, and then I was hired as a feature writer at a mid-sized paper in Stanton, Virginia. And I was there exactly a year and won the state feature writing award in the Virginia Press Association. And then I was hired by the larger regional paper, the Roanoke Times, and I, I went there to become the night police reporter. So and I was covering crime and... Right. horrible things and, you know, working from three in the afternoon to one or two a.m. It was always uh, a huge, huge challenge, but a chance to learn a lot. So, Roland, let, let's backtrack. OK, you, you just dropped that you had an aneurysm at 24. The doctor's telling you, get your affairs in order. So what is going through your mind? Like you going for a run? You're a young father at the time. What was going through your mind? Why did you decide to test yourself like that? Well, I, I figured I had to know one way or the other. Oh, I've always oh. sort of been, um, I don't know, you know, I've just sort of always been <laughs> fearless. And I don't mean that to, like I'm bragging. It's more a function of stupidity. <laughs> but uh, I, I really do think you have to, uh, if you're pursuing something that you want, you know, it's sort of like, I never really had an idea of what I wanted till all of that transpired. And then I wanted to be a writer. And I, it wasn't that I wanted to write about the NBA. I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And I was writing. I was working hours and hours and hours. You know, 80-hour weeks were the norm. Wow. So would you say the, so the aneurysm was a catalyst for this just right. intense obsession? Second, Okay. The second part of the catalyst was that while I was in Roanoke writing on the night police beat, my father, who I revered, who was a basketball nut, he was one of these old two-handed set shooters nice. out of the 1930s, out of the hills of southern West Virginia. Well, he was diagnosed with brain cancer. He had a very ugly death. It took eight months. It was really very hard. And I would work till 1 or 2 a.m., and I would go over to the hospital and sit up with him. And it was a very emotional time. Hmm. I mean, this guy was really a basketball nut. And I worshipped Jerry West yeah. and West, all things West Virginia. And so when he passed, I began playing pickup basketball like crazy. I knew at the time why I was doing it, because it made me feel closer to him. I was playing six days a week. I just very quickly became obsessed with it. Mm. And I was working as a writer. But I also 
had gotten a scholarship to go to the writing program at Hollins University. They have a really fine writing program. And I'm working full time and taking classes in the writing program. And one of my first classes, the professor says, you know, if you, you want to be a writer, then you really need to write a book. And one of the things I had learned at VMI that has been the guiding principle in my life is divergent thinking. And that is there's not one right answer to any problem. You really have to sit and list all the potential right answer. One thing I was doing as a journalist, and it was great, I was constantly making lists. You know, what story should I do next? I'd make a list of 10 or 15, all right? Uh, who are the people I need to interview for the story? And I'd make a list of 10 or so. And I'd say, all right, what questions am I going to ask this person? I'd make lists of questions. And I wouldn't worry if the question was good or bad or the idea was good or bad. I'd just get the list down. So I was sitting in class that day, and I said, what book should I write? And number seven on my list was a book about Ralph Sampson. Mm -hmm. He was a seven-foot-four center. I don't know if you remember him. But he had transformed the culture at the University of Virginia. And not just at the university, but for the entire state. He was literally he was a beast. the state of Virginia's first black hero. Yeah. And so I did this cultural book about him, also the basketball story. It was excerpted by the Associated Press, my newspaper, because I found out all this stuff that nobody knew. You know, he was learning disabled, uh, all this stuff. Dr. Bob Rotel, the famous sports psychologist was relatively unknown then, but he was working with the Virginia basketball team. And, you know, it's just sort of the thing I do. I interview all these people and I find the human story. Right. Because you can write all the basketball you want. And you can get any kid working for the college newspaper to write up the basketball story. But to understand the competitive mind, you really have to understand the family. And you usually have to understand the mother well, the father well. In my mind, look at as much of the family history as possible. Because that really sort of provides the mindset of the competitor. And I did that early on with Samson. The Sporting News, which was a big cheese back, this was 82, 83. Mm -hmm. The Sporting News excerpted the book in three parts. And that just led to all sorts of opportunity in basketball. John Thompson, who was the coach of Georgetown back then, read the book and liked it. And had just won the NCAA championship with Patrick Ewing and the Hoyas. Mm -hmm. And they hired me to write their national championship book. And, of course, I left the newspaper. You know, I think I'm, I made 30000 in 11 weeks. And, and my salary for working at insane levels at the newspaper in the early 80s was $18,000. That's so terrible. The That's terrible. The business changed dramatically. <laughs> but it was also at a small enough level when I got this editor's job at the weekly newspaper. There are a lot of people going into journalism, working for big dailies, doing fancy stuff. But at that weekly paper, I had to do everything. I had to size the photos. I had to write the headlines. I had to lay out the pages. I had to write the columns. I had to cover the games. You know, I'd never had any journalism training, but it was for four months, very intense journalism training. And I mean, the deadlines were brutal and the amount of work was a lot. And so that learning experience was sort of mirrored when I began doing all the different kinds of championship books and texts for picture books and different projects I was getting back in the 80s. Right. You know, uh, there are a couple of things I, I want to say. I've taught college journalism for 21 years. I don't teach it anymore. Mm -hmm. But obviously, divergent thinking is one of the key principles. I, I really think people have to learn to think and to trust their thoughts. And any media or sales career must be idea-driven. Mm. And we fail or succeed first on the quality of our ideas and second on our ability to execute those ideas. Now, the great thing about great ideas is it gives you the opportunity to learn to execute. And that was the story of a good bit of my career. To advance in uh, the publishing world, the literary world, you know, you have to understand, I was this guy coming out of left field. I didn't go to Princeton or Harvard or Missouri School of Journalism or any of that stuff or Columbia. I was uh, some old 
a late blooming redneck who really wasn't connected to anyone. Mm. But I had all these great ideas once I got going. Now, really to succeed, though, you have to have an agent. You have to find a sales force. Right. But I couldn't trust the sales force because they were representing big name writers. Mm. And I had all of these great ideas. And so if you're an agent and you're sitting there saying, well, I got this yokel from Southwest Virginia who's got these great ideas. He probably can't get 20 grand for any book he does. Mm. And I've got this stable of writers I represent and they all get 100,000 a book. Let's see. I get 15% of what I sell. So obviously, I wasn't in the economic bracket to really take advantage of having an agent. And so I had to spend a long time being my own sales force. Right. And as a result, the arc of my career has gone longer. I have eventually gotten there to where I have an agent. You know, Little Brown, one of the best publishers in the world, uh, publishes my work. I get paid really well to when I write books, I'm trying to decide now if I want to do another one. But I really had to operate on the strength of my ideas. And it involved all kinds of relationships, too. The other great principle that I think is important is, uh, and I would always explain this and encourage my students to do this, I call it the best minds principle. Mm-hmm. And it's also the power of the age we now inhabit. The best minds principle is that you encounter the best minds in in your chosen field or in any endeavor you're doing, and you try to make those people your colleagues. And Billy Packer back then worked for CBS. He did the college Final Four, broadcasted every year for decades. He was quite the guy in college basketball. When I was doing the Samson book, I was you know, traveling to Charlottesville and around the old ACC covering games, and I made a point of getting to know Billy. We ended up doing five books together. I talked to him a couple of weeks ago on the phone. We're still good friends and colleagues. Well, your whole endeavor, whatever you're doing, is active learning. Yes. And that's what really... You see these people who are fully engaged. Maslow had a term for it. It escapes me right now. Right. But you see these people who are fully engaged. And really what they are in my mind often is active learners. They are reaching out to people. It's a lot of journalists and writers are this way, particularly nonfiction writers. They're meeting these people. They're learning from them. They have an excuse to do interviews yes. and to gather everything from the best minds. And, you know, people like to talk about themselves, but to interview best minds, you really have to up your game. You have to do tons of research. Your questions have to be really, really, really good. You have to engage people on a very human level. And there's a lot of psychology to it. You have to think about it. And, of course, my career became a process of best minds. Probably the greatest mind, and I've been able to engage many, but Tex Winter, who was the assistant coach for the Bulls and the Lakers, the genius who developed the triangle offense, became one of my closest associates. He changed my life. I also think a third thing, a third principle is understanding what you're doing on a deeper level. If you're a journalist, you've got to understand it all on a deeper level. And you have to work really hard to do that. If you're writing about a certain thing, you have to understand it on a deeper level. I submit that I think if you're selling something, if you're just selling cars, my first job out of college for uh, eight weeks was selling cars. And I sold 11 of them the first month. But then I got a teaching and coaching job. And the guy was upset when I left the auto lot. But uh, the best auto salespeople, I I don't mean to be rambling here, but I want to point out they have tremendous product knowledge. And they really understand things. I look for those people when I go shopping for automobiles. You know, our, our job at any level is to be an expert. And a big part of that is this active learning. Now, what's so cool about today, you know, there are all kinds of setbacks, but 
someone such as yourself doing a podcast or having a blog where you interview people, mm-hmm. well, I'm preaching to the choir here with you. You, <laughs> you call up all sorts of people and the podcast and the blog. Those mm-hmm. things are the pretext for all the active learning you want to do, for engaging all the good minds you can find anywhere. So, Roland, you've covered some really great principles here. Like, there's stuff like uh, divergent thinking. Like, say someone wants to, like, um, you know, beef up their muscle around divergent thinking. What can they do? What are steps? Same with like being your own sales force, and also the best minds principle. Like, give the audience some how-to steps of how to strengthen well, the muscles. Say, I, I married an absolutely beautiful woman 43 years ago. I love her today more than ever. <laughs> Yeah. And let's say that I wanted to write some silly, mushy poem for. And I want to look at all the options for my hard rhymes in this silly poem. And, you know, one of the first words I'm going to think of as an in rhyme is blue. And so before I even start to write, I want to look at what options are there. So what am I going to do? I'm going to list all the words that rhyme with blue. And that's crew, shoe, woo, I don't know. The, you know, you don't worry about what are the good ones. In divergent thinking, you just make the full list. So it's the same in whatever. You take any fundamental question. I had this great professor at VMI who fished me out of that trash bin my final semester there. He was an industrial psychology teacher. and He's the guy that taught me about divergent thinking. Mm-hmm. But he took it so far as to say, Let's say you got to make a decision in life. I have a daughter right now who's got a fabulous job, and she was invited to apply for another fabulous job, and she was torn about it. And so now she's a finalist for this other job, and she's sweating it out, making this decision on what to do. And this professor of mine at VMI always said, well, you put a dollar figure on everything. And he says, I know it sounds crass, but let's say if you're taking a new job and you have to move and you live in this neighborhood where you really love the people and you really like your next door neighbors a lot. Well, you're putting a dollar figure on your salary. You're looking at, is there a car included? You have to put a dollar figure on having neighbors like that because that's often a once in a lifetime gift. Mm -hmm. And so... It's really taking the time to list everything. It's comprehensive. You really stretch your mind. You really do. It's called divergent thinking because you don't worry about the right answer. Uh, The right answer would be convergent thinking. You're going to converge your thoughts on what you choose. Right. But during divergent thinking, you're just listing all the potential answers. You don't worry. And the, the reason Ralph Sampson was number seven on my list was that after I made my list, and there were some good items on that list, I was a very hardworking reporter. I knew a lot of people. I was covering the court system. I was covering prisons. I wasn't stuck in sports. I was doing the full world. And I had a lot of options. But I looked at the logistics. One, I wanted a book that would sell, that was caught up in the popular mind. Mm-hmm. I wanted to write about a popular subject. I had to select a book. You know, writing nonfiction, actually doing anything in life depends on your expertise. Mm-hmm. And one of the hard parts about crossing the bridge is that you have to become an expert to qualify to write about things. Mm-hmm. That's the brilliant thing about doing a podcast or running a blog and interviewing all these people. You can target your expertise. You can select and find the best minds in an area Mm -hmm. that makes your expertise. I would submit that we're not just one-trick ponies. I like sports because I like issues of race. I love business. I love celebrity. Uh, There are a whole cluster of things that are important when you're, uh, you know, I, I love shoe company stuff. I love broadcasting. All of these things come into this cluster of things about which I work to be an expert. Right. And so all of this follows these principles, follows the active learning. I submit you don't have to be a journalist to do interviews. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people in other fields miss the opportunity to engage 
that interviewing offers. It's great for shy people as well as outgoing people because it gives you a reason, an entree to speak with really important and interesting people. For sure. And there's no question of it, such as yourself, obviously. And so, Roland, you've mentioned many great tactics and principles along your career journey. What kind of advice can you give people out there who are going after something? They want to stand out, get themselves out there. You're talking about divergent thinking and being your own, your own sales force and best minds. Like, what kind of plan can you give people? Like, What do you suggest they do? Well, you have to have a knowledge base. And then that other principle of a deeper level of understanding, a deeper level of knowledge. And one of the best ways to do that, once you know where you want to work, you can be a 22-year-old kid that wants to write about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard to get in there. You know, you have to have a media credential. You have to have this and that. And, you know, they, they want to keep an eye on who they let in on a media pass. A media pass is wonderful, but you don't always start out with that media pass. But I think the important thing that was really so good for me is the concept of formers. You know, if you want to write about Toronto, you might interview the former mayor. He's not as busy as the mayor. The mayor's in the spotlight. And we, we could go on forever about sure. Toronto mayors, but I don't want to go there. Yeah, well, yeah, what, take a back seat to that. <laughs> one of the former mayors is out of the spotlight largely, or some of them. And so you interview the former people. What happens with formers, and, and this is true of all kinds of older Americans, whether it's former NBA players, former hockey players, former football players, former presidents, former whatever your expertise is. I had a kid, for example, one of my college classes who was in ROTC to become an Army officer, and I told him he needed to start interviewing retired officers. I went to VMI and a couple of my buddies were full bird colonels. They said that would be the fastest way to become a general, Hmm. just acquiring all that knowledge. And so you have to use the divergent thinking to create your process for deciding the people you might talk to. You also use it in your process for deciding the questions and different things you're going to use in that interview process. And so divergent thinking is big. It gives you the big ideas on the people to talk to. You make lists of them. It's an entire window to the process. But if you're a young kid, this suddenly gives you a chance to gain real expertise in any field that you are truly motivated in, if you think about it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are two keys there. People love to talk about themselves. You know, we live in an age, back when I was coming along, you had to have a job at a newspaper, and those things were hard to get. We didn't even train sports journalism when I started teaching college journalism back in the 1990s because it was all newspaper stuff. Mm. I taught 20 years. By the end, we were training tons of journalists because the Internet had created so many sports journalism opportunities. Mm -hmm. And you can create your own. The main point is you get your podcast or your blog. That's like having your own media empire. It's just up to you to have the ideas, to drive the traffic, to monetize what you're doing. You know, I've seen endless cases of people come along doing what I just laid out, and suddenly somebody will come along and like ESPN and purchase their blog. True Hoop. Hoops Hype, the international website, all these places started out in that fashion. You know, several Los Angeles Lakers sites started out in, in that fashion. And it happens everywhere. Yes, these are the worst of times, but they're also the very best of times. I was talking to a group of young professionals last Friday, and I was pointing out that they're sitting on the apex of human history, Mm. that everything that's happened has put them in a position to have unparalleled personal power. If you were a prince in the Middle Ages, you might be able to employ 50 monks to write handwrite books. And so I always call this monk power. If you had a lot of wealth, you might have 50 monks. Well, if you're just the average Joe with a laptop like I'm looking at today, and you you let your fingers dance across the keyboard, you're summoning the armies of robots from the Internet. Your monk power is probably measured in the trillions. Right. And so it is a truly magnificent time. The other thing that's important to point out, 
if you own a laptop and you have the ability to do those things, well, you're part of a culture that is rare. You're a one or two percenter. Mm -hmm. The rest of the globe is hustling around for a little cold rice in the mornings. Right. We have seven, eight billion people on the planet. The people in your age group, mm -hmm. almost no one has. It. I mean, when you're looking at the real percentages of the human population. And so if you're a chosen one, if all these resources are basically being expended on your behalf, it's like you're sitting in a throne room twiddling your thumbs wondering what to do. My point is get busy. You are a prince of the universe. Mm. You have this wonderful opportunity. And don't waste your life. You might end up with a diagnosis of a aneurysm yeah. at 24. Um, you know, whatever it is that lights the rocket fuel of your wonder about the mystery and magic of life, find it. Uh, you know, Michael Jordan was great. If somebody didn't say something to piss him off, he'd think of something they said and then pretend they said it just so he was ready to go. And that part of us is not that complicated. Right. We know how to get to ourselves if we really want to. And Michael was a genius at it. Mm -hmm. Sir, I must say, you are a great storyteller. There's a really good reason why you're so successful writing. And this past interview has been proof of that. Just so many great tips, uh, great stories. Just curious, Rolando, what's up next for you? I'm working on a film. I'm writing a script for a film. It's set in New England, and it's about Bob Cousy and Holy Cross. And mm -hmm. it's really the story of the rise of genius through convention. And, you know, he's coming out of 1940s basketball. Wow. You know, I'm having fun with it. I got to sit down with Bob Cousy for about five hours two weeks ago. Wow. And uh, he's almost 90. Wow. He'll be 90 this year. I look like his older brother. I'm 65, <laughs> by the way. Wow, okay. And there are a bunch of these guys from these teams at Holy Cross from back in the 40s and 50s that I've been dealing with on this project. I have to admit, though, I really have worked so hard. I hit a period of utter and complete burnout. And I'd never done that. I'd always been possessed of just tremendous personal energy and drive. Mm, and so it. uh, it's been an odd experience for me recovering from the burnout. I've sort of turned down the opportunities to do more books because I want to enjoy my life and figure out what's important beyond. I mean, I work like heck. I have three wonderful kids, two great grandkids. I love them all. And, uh, you know, I want to take the time to treasure that. So I'm not sure I'm going to, you have to understand that doing these big books and getting paid well for them is a dream come true. Mm. But the pressure mm. is unbelievable. It is unreal to work day after day after day, 14 hours a day, not a minute to breathe. Up at 3 a.m., working to about 9, getting a nap, getting back into it, plowing into about 7 p.m., trying to calm down a little bit and then trying to get in bed so you can get about six hours of sleep. And you do it day after day, after week, after week, after month, after month, after year, after year. It adds it's up. just too much. For the listeners out there, Roland, uh, guys, you got to understand, like, these books are like tombs. They're like bricks. They're really big. So The Jordan book is 700 pages. It, the, it's the, unbelievable. The book is... 650. The Jerry West book's about 550. Oh I think, my God. That I did for ESPN. But I'll tell you that it's not all basketball. I write about mothers. I write about culture. If you're looking at great competitors that everyone emulates, you don't really understand them till you go all the way back and then you build their lives through the decades, through their parents and everything going on in their families. It's, uh, it's a fascinating way to study. Um, great competitive minds, Definitely. competitive spirits. Yeah, and you've done that incredibly well. Just anybody, like, read his books, and you'll see he's really mastered that art. Now, Roland, where can people find out more about you? Like, I know you're off the grid right now, but when you are on it, like, do you have social media? Like, where can yes, people I, I have um, at Lazenby for Twitter. Mm -hmm. I had one of my students, I always said as a professor, I learn more from my students than they ever learned from me. And I had a bright young guy, Andy Major. He's in Detroit now, but he's been all over America working 
in various capacities. But he got me involved with Twitter like it must have been the first week. <laughs> and he got me involved in Facebook, and those things are good. I, mm-hmm. I largely use Twitter for interacting with readers and fans and mm-hmm. friends. Facebook some, too. Okay. Great. And email. You know, I answer emails. And uh, I do have a lot of people come to me for advice like I've just conveyed to you. Sure. Not that I know it all, but right. you have to go through these things. There's really not a textbook for a lot of it. Mm-hmm. You know, Rowan, like throughout this whole interview, I, I'm just here just listening to your stories. I'm a basketball geek. I'm just listening to you talking about Jerry West, Ralph Sampson, and then I'm also a writing geek. So you're talking about the publishing process. I'm also a marketing geek. And you're talking about like your marketing tactics and how you got yourself out there. It's just been an absolute pleasure just listening to you. Like, I really appreciate you, appreciate you taking this time. Well, Dave, you're very kind to even be concerned about it and to include me. So I much appreciate it. For sure. Everybody, please check out Roland's books. Uh, Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the Standout Now podcast on iTunes. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Standout Now podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and rate and review it as well. You can find out more about our program at thestandoutnowpodcast.com. Thanks again and enjoy your week.